Uh, welcome and uh, to today's energy seminar. We have a very special event today, but before that, the usual housekeeping announcements. David Crane, our speaker, who's right here now, will be staying to meet with students afterward. Uh, this will include students who are assigned to this discussion section. If you're a registered student, you know what that means. Uh, we, are, we have permission to use this room for that, so we're not space constrained. So anybody else who wants to stay in the student community, maybe outside, can come and sit up in the front here and have a little extended Q&A with David. Registered students should sign that they were here in their sign-up sheet in, in the back. Uh, good news, uh, in addition, uh, this is a day when we'll have an Explore Energy social outside with really good food right out the back door. That'll start 5.30, but go to 6.45 for people who want to chit-chat with David. Maybe David will go join at the end if he's hungry enough at that point. And finally, on behalf of the Precord Institute, Schultz Fellowship application deadlines for graduate students has been extended to January 27th and undergraduate fellowships to February 7th. So uh, without further ado, we're gonna do this in the form of a brief talk by David Crane, our speaker, and a uh, fireside ch chat with Stephen Chu, who will take over the podium now and introduce David and moderate the fireside chat and the questions, and a couple of us will run up and down the aisles with microphones for the Q&A session. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Professor Steve Chu, who you all know and needs no further introduction from me. Steve. Um, I've been asked to introduce David Crane and have a fireside chat with him. Uh, he may not remember. I remember him. <laughs> uh, what I remember is, well, let me just say briefly, he uh, was an undergraduate at uh, Princeton uh, in the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs, and from there he went to Harvard and got a law degree. He's probably best known for his time at NRG. It's a, a, a power company, an electricity power company. They recruited him um, maybe five or six months, I'm not sure, after they went chapter 11. <laughs> so it's a very brave soul that he was willing to <laughs> see what he could do with NRG. And he turned that company, this failing company, into a really ongoing concern, uh, profitability, all sorts of other things. And it was during that time that I got to meet him. Um, NRG is a utility uh, electricity company. He was, spent his, David, spent his entire career in energy and various things, starting with ABB, it's a Swiss Swiss company that does electricity transmission. <coughs> um, I don't want to go through all of that, but I just want to say one thing that I do remember. Uh, when I was secretary, uh, we had a loan program, and I had to personally sign for each loan. Uh, so the, if a loan failed, it was on me, and so all the failures were my fault. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, there were some notable failures. Uh, there were some notable successes. Uh, Tesla. Uh, we kept Tesla from going bankrupt, certain bankruptcy, and uh, allowed them to get out of a lot of warrants. We gave them a couple, we had a, a couple of billion dollars of warrants. Warrants are things you can buy stock at a certain price. The price was $85, the stock was three fifty. We had 300,000 shares, you can do the math. Uh, but they needed to refinance and so we struck a deal with them, you pay back the loan early, we won't capture full value of the warrants. So we saved them a second time. <laughs> uh, with NRG, um, NRG wanted to, to do a pilot demonstration, a big pilot demonstration uh, of capturing CO2. The CO2 would then be used for enhanced oil recovery. In my opinion, it was the first large, medium large scale CO2 capture that showed at last, there was some confidence that you could reach a price point for the capture of CO2 using advanced amines. Um, and so that was, that was a big deal. Uh, we, of course, there is no market yet for CO2, uh, but we hope soon there will be. Now, um, so David went through a lot of things, but uh, he's been nominated very, very recently to serve as the Undersecretary for Infrastructure within the Department of Energy. Uh, there are three undersecretary jobs in the Department of Energy. This is a new one. 
and it is something where he will tell you about uh, a new thrust in the Department of Energy to really try to accelerate deployment uh, at large scale, uh, not to wait 20, 50, 60 years because we simply don't have enough time, but he will tell you all about that. So without further ado, uh, uh, David Crane. <laughs> Thank you all for being here, and I, I'm going to be uh, very brief in my opening remarks because you know, I'm, I'm so well. I'm honored to be here and to be have the opportunity to talk to Dr. Chu. Uh, you know, not only a Nobel Prize winner, but a former Secretary of, of Energy. So, so I don't want to keep him waiting. And uh, but l let me just give a, um, you know a bit of uh, background and, and say it's it's very very exciting. Um, just to be particularly among students in the sense that, um, you know, I, I feel one of the, the things I bring to the, you know, the party now is that, you know, I, I'm 63 years old. I spent 38 years in the private sector. I never really contemplated for any serious amount of time uh, becoming a civil servant working in government. Um, you know, I... I had the fortune uh, throughout my career of, of, of doing something that I enjoyed, uh, doing something that I thought was impactful, you know, um, working in a company where, you know, provide a good living for 10,000 uh, employees and being basically at the very end of my career and having transitioned to a situation where I, ser I was serving on a few boards uh, that were interesting to me, you know, I, I had and you know had you know uh, a lot you know going on in my uh, personal life and in last about 12 months ago now you know i get a call uh from the uh, chief of staff of the secretary of energy and that is a person named Tarek shaw and he who i didn't know and he he said to me he said you know congress just passed this infrastructure uh, law and uh, they gave the Department of Energy $90 billion, which is roughly three times uh, the amount of money it's ever been given in the past. And the one key to it is that, you know, we're, we're gonna use this to bring all these emerging uh, clean energy technologies to commercial scale to get across the celebrated valleys of death that exist sort of across entrepreneurship. Um, and so we've got this $90 billion, but Congress is mandating that, that the money be a, a matched fund. So, so the government will provide up to 50% of the money, but the private sector. So we figure we need a private sector person to run this. And, and I said, oh, so I said, well, I've been around. So what type of person you're looking for? And they, they listed, you know, five uh, qualifications. And they, I said, well, it sounds like you're reading from my resume. He goes, I am reading from your resume. <laughs> would, would, would you be interested in doing this? And, and, uh, beca and, it wasn't really anything that I actually aspired to do, but you know, the point I'm getting to is that I hope that when, even when you're young, you realize what a shockingly historic moment that we are, um, not only in the, I mean, you could say in the history of the United States, but you, know, you could say in the history of humanity. We uh, were having a, a meeting with Christiana Figueres the other day, and she was talking about how, you know, we've actually been alive during the, the Holocene era, and now we're in the Anthropocene, you know, in our lifetime. So she was putting it in these, like, geological, you know, epics. But all I know is that, uh, from my perspective, you know, I sort of look at American history, um, you know, in, in sort of 25-year segments. And if you go back to... Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not a technologist like a lot of people in the room. So I go back and I look at it and I say, okay, if you think of a generation as 25 years long and for the ease of math, let's start with the first generation, the founding fathers being 1775 to 1800. That means that the, uh, that the 2000 to 25 generation is the 10th generation of American leadership. And I think what's made America great is that most Amer in most American ages, the leadership class of the United States rose to the challenge of its time. So when we, as we end, as we end the 10th generation of American leadership, 2000, 2025, and I think that climate change has been the challenge of our thing, 
did we succeed in solving it? And, you know, we did not. And a couple years ago, I was very pessimistic about this. But with this legislation that's been passed, we have this opportunity, those of us who are about to leave the stage, you know, to create a difference, to get the ball rolling so that all of you who are students here at Stanford, you know, can finish the job. And so that's what I'm committed to. And, you know, I, we're just extraordinarily lucky that Congress and, and President Biden have both co cooperated to put these tools in our, into our tool chest. So we have this on the board and, and this, you know, we're gonna talk about this more, but, but just very quickly, let's, let's start with hydrogen. In energy, you know, in the energy world, you, you can very think of the 19th century as the age of coal, the 20th century of the age of oil. We have the opportunity with seven, seven to $8 billion now to create this as the age of hydrogen. Hydrogen is the f fuel that can, that can solve hard to abate industries. It's the fuel that can, can, can solve heavy duty land transport, maritime, and ultimately aviation. So, so this, this is a potential that like we've never seen before to do hydrogen and for us you know, to create these production hubs when you add the tax credits, you know, creates an economic opportunity Carbon management, we have, we have money for carbon capture, uh, demonstration size, pilot size. We all know, I think at this point, that we're not gonna go to decarbonize fuels entirely. We're gonna need some fossil fuel, so we need to decarbonize them, and we have this seven billion. Industrial decarbonization, I would say to all the environmentalists in the room, I think that we've done a disservice to ourselves by labeling you know, steel, aluminum, you know, cement as hard to abate sectors, because I can tell you, having been on the inside of a steel company in the last few years, even the most progressive of companies in those sectors are saying, well, the environmental community is calling us hard to abate. So what that translates to us is that we don't have to do anything about this for at least another decade. So most of the heavy industry companies that I know are sort of planning on doing something about their basic, uh, you know, industrial heat processes in the 2035 timeframe. The role of the federal government right now, and there's no other government on the earth that's allocated $6.3 billion to specifically address hard to abate sectors. What we want to do is bring that uh, corporate planning forward to make the companies that are in those space say that competitively priced green steel, green aluminum, green cement, you know, green glass, food and beverage industry, that that's happening this decade that's not happening next decade. And we, you know, we have the others, the long duration energy storage. We all know that we have to deal with the intermittency of, of, of you know, wind and solar. So you know, th this is what was given us by Congress. Um, you know, we're very excited about it. You know, if you look closely in the legislation, you can see signs of political horse trading. But for someone who's spent their life in the energy industry, I think this is just remarkably insightful of this tool that we've got. And now, and now it's left to the Department of Energy, you know, together with sister agencies that have other buckets of money. But for us, we think at the DOE, we're at the point of the spear on this. And you know, between the loan program office and the Office of Clean Energy Demonstration, they, they offer debt. We offer, we offer what I call free equity you know, we, we, you know, we give the money as if it were equity, except the difference is we don't require a return on capital or a return of capital. So it's pretty attractive money. We're willing to take risks. We're willing to put the entire power of the federal government behind it. We're gonna work with states and local governments on fast tracking permitting. We're gonna look at the purchasing power of the federal government to see where that can be helpful. So the Biden administration, Jennifer Granholm's Department of Energy, us at the Office of Clean Energy Demonstration, we're all in on making this happen. And I look forward to hearing, you know, and I, I look forward also for people to challenge, you know, uh, what we have to say, but that's what I have to say, Dr. Chu, and so I'm gonna stick with that. So, so thank you. Uh, I think this is my better side. So. That's right. <laughs> I have no good side. Yes, <laughs> me neither. <laughs> okay, so um, let me start with a perspective question. The Department of Energy 
is essentially an R&D organization. It supports a lot of research. The biggest support of the physical sciences as a national lab system that's, you know, envy of the rest of the world. Uh, but there's now a shift going on, or if not a shift, a broadening of the perspective uh, to deployment. Uh, instead of R&D hoping that industry will take what hap comes out of universities, national labs, and deploy. And Jennifer Granholm, Secretary Granholm, is very, very serious about really trying to get this accelerated. Can you give the audience a little perspective on why is it so important to begin to emphasize deployment? Well, let me, let me say, say two things about that. And again, if we have uh, budding scientists in the room, there, there's, not, there's no greater hidden gem in, in, to be in the United States government than the 17 national labs. They're, they're just extraordinary. I, you know, I've only been in government four months. I've had a chance to visit two of the labs. And it's just, uh, you know, I went to law school, so my education was ill-used. But, uh, but, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's just very impressive, and it's important to commercial demonstration because even today we were dealing with a situation with a you know where the Department of Energy is supporting something that the private sector is taking over and the private sector uh, partner insisted on basically you know sort of talking uh, in their circles about DOE support because to them, uh, the, the, DO, the DOE uh, backed by the national labs basically legitimizing the technology is, is like the, the good housekeeping seal of approval. And so it all starts from that technological core, but where we come in, where we're the new part of the Department of Energy, is that uh, traditionally the Department of Energy has taken uh, demonstration very literally. We demonstrate uh, at scale a piece of hardware and we're not particularly fussed if once we've demonstrated, you know, it becomes a rusting hulk. Uh, but the legislation as passed by Congress has introduced the idea of, they call them hubs. So it's hydrogen hubs. And the word hub, I translate that into ecosystem. So as we evaluate proposals for hydrogen production, we are very intentionally told to look at the input fuels, the way they're producing the hydrogen, and the most important, what the hydrogen is going to be used for. And we're told to use it for four different purposes so that they're called demonstration projects, but they're actually meant to be the enduring pillars of a hydrogen uh, economy. And so that, puts a, that, that makes the requirement of very different skill sets, uh, very private sector-oriented thinking to how to make these projects all economically viable for long periods of time, which, as you can imagine, is particularly different, difficult in the case of carbon because, you know, private sector solves for what society will pay for. And with there not being a price on carbon, you know, there's a fundamental challenge there that we have to face. But again, they've given tax credits and all, so we hope to get there. So hydrogen is fundamentally um, a sh a storage mechanism in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, you have energy from various, uh, uh, except for one, namely if you can take natural gas and shift it into hydrogen and CO2, sequester the CO2, then it's a conversion of natural gas to hydrogen. Mm -hmm. um, but you'd have to sequester the CO2. Of course, there's a different color. So there are different colors of hydrogen. There's gray. You take the natural gas, you vent the CO2 you're no better off in carbon emissions, or you capture and sequester it. Uh, which is blue. Blue, right. And then? And then there's green, which means you have completely renewable wind, solar, whatever, hydro, and you turn that into hydrogen in, by some means, uh, which then has no inherent carbon emissions. And so those are the different colors. Well, there's another, though. Gray, green, blue, is there another? Other yes. Blue? Okay. Can, can, can we all just record that, like, I taught Dr. Chu uh, <laughs> something here, because I, I want to record. Are we being recorded? Because I really want this. So, so, no, we also are supposed to incent uh, pink hydrogen. Is it pink? It's pink. Pink. From nuclear. Ah. 
Okay, fine. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I Nuclear's see, not quite. I can see he doesn't believe. So. No, 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 no. Nuclear, nuclear people are very, uh, because of uh, high temperature and, and electricity and, uh, and um, but, but let's, let's continue with this. Um, it, is, it is something uh, many of us want to invent better electrolysis, things like that. But where do you see this going and when do you think we can get off of the uh, blue hydrogen? Well, I, I think um, the, again, the, at the Department of Energy, we, we honor the legislation that we are, we are tasked with uh, implementing. And the legislation specifically calls for us to use hydrogen for four different purposes. One is uh, for heavy duty land transport. The second is for hard to abate heavy industrial one is for co-firing and power generation. And I think the fourth one is district heating. It, any, most people from the private sector would suggest that those last two are, are not viable long-term markets. Uh, you know, I mean, the, you know, the old uh, metaphor that they use, uh, you know, to use hydrogen uh, for district heating or to use hydrogen for co-firing and power generation is like, you know, washing your hair with Evian water. It's a... You know, it's a valuable fuel that's being underutilized. The Japanese are starting to create a hydrogen infrastructure by using it for coal-fired and power generation with the very conscious intent to shift as quickly as possible to use it for heavy industry and for transport. We, as we select the 10 hydrogen hubs, have to pick, uh, you know, for those four. But with, within that, you know, there are a lot of issues. Uh, there's a lot of issues about connective tissue. You know, we were discussing last night how to ship hydrogen uh, safely. Um, uh, so, you know, you know we're, we're looking at, at that and, um, you know, looking for, you know, look at, again, that, to me, that's all part of the hub is that we're looking at the entire ecosystem and the, the weaknesses. And, you mentioned uh, new electrolyzers, and I know there's a lot of work. You know, we're electrolyzers for those is the key uh, piece of equipment to make green hydrogen because uh, electrolyzer makes hydrogen through an electrical process. You know, help me if I miss that up. <laughs> Traditionally, hydrogen has sep been separated in the United States using heat. Um, and, um, but, you know, since wind and solar make electricity directly, electrolyzers are very important. A very uh, great, uh, a, a, a very good thing about the way that we've been incented is we have this money for hydrogen hubs, but uh, but it's not on here. But Congress also authorized something like six billion dollars for for critical manufacturing and supply chain. Because, and if you, if Secretary Granholm were here right now, she would be making the national security argument that as we as we pivot the American energy economy to these new uh, types of clean fuels, the idea is not to cr not to substitute one foreign dependency, you know, for another. So, you know, the country has been dependent on Middle Eastern oil, you know, since I was a kid in the 70s. And now we don't want to be uh, dependent on electrolyzers from a, a, a different manufacturing co uh, country. And there's also a need for new types of technologies in electrolyzers because of the nature of the way electrolyzers were, w would work, which you would know more about. And don't get me started talking about iridium and how we have to find a substitute for iridium but, uh, in this country. But. Perhaps you can tell uh, the audience about hydrogen in steel making and how, it, of course, it's not going to get rid of all the carbon emissions, but it can do a lot. And in your experience, also with Tata Steel, uh, yeah. I as before, I uh, uh, had to resign for every aspect of my life in order to cleanse myself to join the United States government. I, I was on the board of Tata Steel, and Tata is an extremely progressive uh, country, a company that wants to do the right thing, and they have a long-term uh, carbon mm -hmm. reduction goal. But but to the point I made earlier, you know there. And I've seen this in multiple industrial companies, not just the ones I've been on the board. And I should say that because you're not supposed to talk about what you hear at board meetings. So, but but most most industrial companies around the country they have a three-step approach to to decarbonize. First is we're going to do everything we can to be as efficient, because there are inefficiencies based in all systems, and that'll get us 
you know, 20 percent of the way. And then we're going to depend on the actual energy industry to, you know, the, the second stage is usually the, uh, you know, the presumption of electrifying everything, depending on the electric industry to have made itself zero carbon, you know, in the next five to 10 years. And then the part that becomes sort of fuzzy in 10 to 15 years out in the future is, okay, but what about your core, you know, high industrial heat process? How are you going to decarbonize that? And that's usually where they shrug their shoulders and say, well, you know, we got 10 or 15 years to figure it. Someone will figure that out. And, you know, that's to my point that we hope to bring that thinking forward. And part of that is hydrogen. Certainly mm-hmm. one solution with steel, you know, you have the traditional blast fur- furnaces versus the electric arc furnaces. So, you know, the electric arc, maybe you could come up with the uh, other solution. But, you know, for the blast furnaces, which is, you know, there aren't that many blast furnaces left in the United States. So, you know, I know I'm rambling here, but one of the issues we have to face when we talk about impact, are we just talking about impact in the U.S.? Or are we talking about carbon impact in terms of what we can prove that will actually have a knock-on effect, you know, in other countries that are doing more of that activity? But certainly to demonstrate hydrogen as the, uh, as the source of high temperature heat for steel making or aluminum making is, is something uh, that's a transformative heavy industry project that we would love to see come across our desk because that's another thing about government. We have to wait to see who, you know, who applies. And so that's one of the reasons uh, you know, we're here is like if, if you want to make you know, steel zero carbon, call me, we'll talk. <laughs> so. One of the issues, though, is uh, in those colors of, um, of hydrogen, uh, the, the one that we do use, which is steam uh, reforming, uh, roughly speaking, in the United States, where natural gas is pretty inexpensive, it's about a dollar a kilogram. And people estimate uh, that the blue hydrogen might be three, maybe less, but the could go to two, two and a half, but three. The green hydrogen, maybe four or five. Mm-hmm. And so the question I have for you is, what do you think the prospects, What do we need a real miracle in electrolyzers? Uh, or do we say in 10 or 20 years, the price of electricity, especially in overabundant electricity, where you can get some of it for free or nearly free, uh, maybe electricity will be a dollar, dollar fifty uh, a kilowatt hour, and where does that? If if it is a dollar, dollar fifty, can can it be in striking distance of using electrolysis? You know, I think if it's in the dollar, dollar fifty, that would be that would be a fabulous outcome. I would accept uh, accept that. And with hydrogen, for those who aren't that familiar with hydrogen, uh, a very uh, a big part of the cost of hydrogen is actually transporting it. Uh, and so, you know, when you're ta- when it, whenever anyone asks you about the price of hydrogen, you have to say, are you talking about hydrogen at the point of production or at the point of consumption? And of course, that itself is a, you know, completely different thing between, and that's why heavy duty land transport is both the highest value use of hydrogen and the most difficult because trucks move around. Uh, you know, it's very much easier to build hydrogen next to a power plant and use it all right there. And so I think if it can get to that, and, yeah. and uh, Dr. Chu, if you told me as a matter of physics that what I'm going to say next makes no sense, then I will, I will meekly uh, submit to you. But, but I take great comfort, you know, just in my own life experience and what happened with uh, the price of a solar panel you know, during my business career, you know, when I first got interested in solar, and I should say, you know, just to be provocative, I, when, I, when I sort of found religion about, you know, shifting my company to renewables, first thing we did was buy a wind company. And after a couple of years, I got disenchanted with wind for a variety of reasons. And I thought, solar's where it's at. You know, and so we sold the wind company and went all in on, on solar. And you know, during Dr. Chu's uh, reign, we built the largest solar thermal plant in the world, which you can see along I-15 if you're driving between LA and Las Vegas, and built the largest solar PV uh, plant in the world at the time. 
But when we first looked at solar, I think it was 4 or $5 a watt to buy a solar panel. And during the course of the Obama administration, in part because of, of overt government action, but in part just because there was an atmosphere at the time that solar is going to happen. You know, and that was not just the U.S., but that was Chinese manufacturing. It was German demand. It was Spanish demand. The price of a solar panel went from five dollars a watt to I think thirty cents a watt. Was was do you know how low it got? Or? Well, it it depends on where do you do. The, the all in costs uh, it's oh, it's below. Sold. Yeah, it, yeah. I'm just it, talking about the cost of the, the module. module. Yeah. yeah, I mean the module yes, is is thirty forty cents a watt yeah. now. It, the all in costs are less than a dollar. The goal of the Department of Energy was a dollar a watt installed installed uh, uh, utility scale and. Um, but you don't think that's a good, uh, uh, do you think that we can do that with hydrogen? Or? Um, first, well, you need, well, if it's going to be green hydrogen, you need a dollar, dollar fifty a kilowatt hour. Yeah. I do think a dollar, dollar fifty a kilowatt hour will be possible within 15, 20 years. There you have it. Nobel Prize winner says it's going to happen. It's just so. my guess. So it's going to happen. <laughs> so. <laughs> But but uh, so but uh, there's there's more to hydrogen. And when uh, you were talking about uh, hydrogen for airplanes, there was a little gasp in the audience. Um, it <laughs> <'cause> <laughs> <in> what? <laughs> because it's um, it's um, pretty low density. But for me, when I think of uh, airplanes, well, you, know, I, you know why I said that? Because <laughs> we were just at a meeting with some entrepreneurs and. I'm like, man, I just tried to do hydrogen for long duty land transport. This person, no, you got to think about hydrogen for aviation. <laughs> well, see, so, there, so there are a lot of aspirational people doing stuff out here. Yeah, but, <laughs> but the, the way most people are thinking now is to take hydrogen and CO2, c convert that into syngas, then that's the feedstock. If mm -hmm. it's a green source of syngas instead of from fossil fuel, then all of a sudden you can make liquid hydrocarbons, mm. which are really very good for airplanes. Good, good. <laughs> and, you know, look, I'm in a battery company and people are talking about battery powered airplanes and maybe little, little ones, but not uh, 777s. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. so, but so that's one of the other things uh, with hydrogen. But let's, let's get, get, go away from hydrogen, carbon capture. It's a big deal because uh, you probably all know that uh, talk of staying below 450 is uh, what I would call wishful thinking at this point. Uh, I personally think we'll go over 550, maybe even 600 parts wow. per million. And because of that, we will need carbon capture, not only from all the point sources, but also from the atmosphere. But how do you, in the government, start this? And I was funding carbon capture as much as I could when I was secretary. Yeah. Uh, because as well, it's, it's in the future, but we need the technology. How do you see developing a market for carbon capture unless there is either a, a regulation penalty or a price on carbon? Well, I, I think ultimately, and, you know, I mentioned it before, I, I mean, again, if everything, the, the energy world is a private sector driven uh, infrastructure play unlike most other infrastructure like roads and things and um, and the private sector solves for what the what they'll be paid to do and so ultimately you know carbon capture is going to require a price on carbon and you know as, as a pragmatic business person uh, you know uh, and I was very involved uh, in Washington as a business person when we tried to get the Waxman Markey uh, bill uh, pass. And we not only didn't get that passed at a time when we had a hope and change president in his first super popular year, we had 59 Democratic senators and we didn't even get it onto the floor, you know, of the, you know, of the Senate. I mean, we got blown out, you know, uh, we got beaten badly. So I think um, the way I look at it, the tax credits for carbon capture under the Inflation Reduction Act are exceptionally lucrative and I think they last and, and they, they vary but but it's a good number and, and and you know a lot of companies were going to do it anyway I mean what I found is I mean you know I, I you know I had sort of an epiphany that made me sort of a climate warrior you know uh, back in 2006 but whenever I went to my board of directors and say you know I never I never talked about this is the moral thing 
you know, to do. You'd get laughed out of an American boardroom if you talked about, you know, morality or anything like that. I, I talked about this is the sound business thing. You know, we make most of our money from coal-fired power generation. You know, if we don't do something to get rid of the carbon emissions from that coal-fired generation, they're going to shut us down. So, you know, you have to, you have to, you know, appeal to that. And I think there's a lot of industry right now. You know, I mean, I thought one of the biggest moments in corporate history that happened during the Trump administration was ExxonMobil gets kicked out of the Fortune 500. I mean, ExxonMobil, like five years before, had been the number one market cap company. And just to show how far behind, you know, they were getting. And so amongst the traditional fossil fuel, I think they want to see carbon capture happen. And I think they see enough uh, economic return in terms of the tax credits for eight years which does not itself create a market. But if in those eight years we bring down the price of capturing carbon to the point where it's within the realm of possibility, then maybe the idea of putting a price on carbon at that point will be more acceptable. And people who have you know, heavy carbon emissions things won't fight it tooth and nail as if it was a life and death matter for them as they're doing behind the scenes right now. So that's, that's the best I can do for you is that it's a two-step process. Yeah, well, uh, actually, uh, what you said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just turn over the questions to the audience. There is this, you know, what companies say in public and what they say behind the scenes. And there's beginning to be a shift. There, well, I'll say the American oil companies still behind the scenes yeah. through the American Petroleum Institute fight, fight these things. I think the European companies are no longer fighting it. And, and, uh, and so what I see them doing is, with lots of pressure from their countries, their respective countries, really trying to do something, shall resign for the American Petroleum Institute. Mm. As it, because it's the American Petroleum Institute that is behind the scenes slow, trying to slow everything up. And so I think these are first, you know, good first steps along this way. Um, but we'll, you know, we'll see. Uh, let's hope. Uh, so let's, uh, I, we can go on forever, but uh, I want to throw it, start to throw it open the questions uh, to the audience. Uh, and so um, first students, uh, do you have any questions? Yes. Thank you very much for coming. It's been a really uh, fascinating talk. Um, I was Could you tell us who uh, you want? Or you don't have to, but I'd love if you'd identify yourself and what you're studying. Yeah, uh, so I'm Evan. Uh, I'm a second year master's student in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department, uh, department or the concentration in Atmosphere and Energy, which is an interdisciplinary renewable energy program. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk more about how the different players will interact in the hydrogen hubs and any of the other similar. Um, like hubs that will happen and I was thinking especially in terms of like how the um, basic sciences and the technology transfer offices at the national labs will interact with large industries and then also um, startups and kind of how that ecosystem will work. So as we've put together the solicitations for these and, and hydrogen is one that I have to be a little bit careful of because it's in mid competition uh, right now uh, but the, the National Labs and the Applied Science Offices and the DOE uh, informed uh, you know, the way we put together the tender. Now, as it happens, and reasonable people could differ like this, we actually think that hydrogen is one of the challenges that's more in, uh, an integration challenge than, uh, you know, apart from electrolyzers and manufacturing. It doesn't represent as much of a leap of faith in the technology as some of the others, like, for example, we have a lot of money for direct air capture. Congress has mandated that we have to look for direct air capture hubs that would sequester uh, or, or remove a million tons of, of carbon from the atmosphere in, with unit sizes of at least 50,000, when the biggest one that we know of that's out there now is 4,000. So, you know, so there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, sort of technological change, but in hydrogen, um, you know, we're, we are informed by the appliance, applied science offices and the national labs. In the case of hy hydrogen, we worked with NREL. 
and so and, and they're part of the evaluation uh, process and so so we've got that in terms of you know what I can say about the hydrogen hubs is that uh, we, we we have 79 concept papers for proposals of which we've gone through this process where we've encouraged uh, 30 roughly 35 I don't remember the exact number and we've discouraged the rest. Now, the rules are, it doesn't matter whether you got encouraged or discouraged, you could still apply, but, um, but the, the sponsors of these represented a very wide range of type of entities. So there are some classic corporate sponsors that you would expect. Um, and then there's ones uh, which I personally refer to more as chamber of commerce bids where a particular part of the country, whether a state or a city, has organized all sort of the hydrogen interests in their area to put together a hub proposal. And, and both have merits and both have uh, areas uh, where they could get stronger. Hi, uh, thank you for coming as well. Uh, I'm Daniel. I'm, I study environmental science in the sustainability school and an MBA at the business school. And it, it's really exciting to see all this funding that's coming out to make these first of their kind projects that are coming up. But I find myself wondering, what about the second of their kind, third of their kind, fourth of their kind? Do you think it'll be the private sector that will have the appetite to keep scaling from these demos up to scale? Or do you think the government will have to step up to kind of carry it, get the curve inflecting upwards? Uh, it's, it's a great question. And, you know, one of the things that makes what we're doing very interesting is there's, 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 no, there's no defined answer to your question. But what, what I would tell you is, is this. First of all, like if we at the Office of Clean Energy Demonstration across these technologies, we can do the first of a kind then the loan program office, you know, which can provide debt, you know, we would love to like hand the baton over to them and maybe they do numbers like two, you know, two through five. Uh, and, and then um, one of the things, what, you know, I, I have idiosyncrasies as a climate person. One of the things that's very upsetting to me as a climate person that's spent my life around the capital markets is when climate, pe there's enough to be depressed about around global warming the people that go around and say to solve this thing globally, we need we need eight gazillion dollars. It's it's pointless. You know, in my life around capital intensive projects, there is always money available for a well structured project. You know, so uh, with a possible exception of three months at the end of 2008 during the financial recession where you couldn't do anything. You know, the money is there if you've got a good project. So I think OSED can do the first of a kind. The loan program office that come in, and then I think we, you know, we've been uh, talking to financial players. They they want to lean in on this. They want to be part of this. You know, sovereign wealth funds, uh, pension funds. They want to deploy money against you know green outcomes. And so, uh, I think that as long as we do it right, triggering the commercial way is is not going to be that difficult. What's going to be difficult is doing it fast enough in the sense that you know, we're working towards a Biden administration target of a zero electricity sector by 2035. You could say that that's aspirational. I might agree with you, but you know, we're going to give it you know, the, the old uh, Stanford College try you know, to, to get there. If you work backwards from 2035 to, OK, well, that means the, that full-fledged commercial wave has to be blown and going by basically 2030, which means that we have to get our projects done you know, sort of in the 2028 time frame, you know, pick your technology. But my supposition is that we might be able to persuade the hydrogen community to start the commercial wave before the first of a kind is even finished. But we're also tasked with, you know, modular nuclear reactors. And after this country's history with the last nuclear project, I think it's gonna be more difficult in the case of that technology I would expect the commercials, the private sector is not going to come in until they see those first projects built on time and on budget because there's not a great track record of that. Ironically, some of the other technologies benefit from having no track record. 
<laughs> but but no track record is better than uh, an you know uninterrupted bad track record. So. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Rishi. I'm a postdoc Can you in put, the chem Hold the mic closer to you because there may be Sorry. some people. Yeah. Who Hi, I'm Rishi. I'm a postdoc in the chemistry department. Uh, I wanted to know um, this is a general question, but specifically for the carbon management uh, bucket, how you guys think about uh, like this fear of accidentally picking winners um, in terms of uh, like the carbon removal space and uh, carbon capture versus some other strategies. And of course, this also applies to nuclear or other technologies where uh, if the incentives, how, how, you, how to incentivize this, how to structure the incentives so that they work uh, for the best technology. So uh, the question, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna give you my very personal, uh, politically incorrect answer to, you know, how do we know that we don't pick winners? And then if you hand the mic uh, to the person who I work with, is that, that Kelly, that is you back there, right? Uh, Ke Kelly actually runs the Office of Clean Energy Demonstration. She just tolerates me pretending that I run it. And she will give you the, the, the uh, government answer but, but yeah. I have to say, you know, private sector for 30 years and, and, if, and the, the great thing that everyone in Washington at the agencies and particularly on Capitol Hill, we're not in the business of picking winners. And, you know, from the private sector, I'm like, don't delude yourself, man. You guys are picking winners in Washington all the time. It also used to be a second cliche that American government doesn't do industrial policy. But that third rail seems like you can get away with saying, well, you know, creating a hydrogen economy is an industrial policy. You don't get fired for that anymore. But I don't know why the government says we don't pick winners when we're having solicitations. We've just encouraged 33 you know, hydrogen hubs and we're going to pick eight to 10. That's picking winners. I, I, don't, I don't know why that's even a bad thing. But Kelly, what's but, the real answer? Kelly, before you answer that, <laughs> let, me, let me just say that um, at, here at Stanford, when we admit uh, undergraduate and graduate students, are we picking winners or losers? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would you rather us pick randomly? <laughs> yeah, it's good. Uh, and so, uh, yes, so when you try to admit the best applicants, when you try to uh, fund the best ideas, uh, but you're not predeterminedly saying, I want this phenotype of person or this phenotype of industry. And when I was secretary, uh, I very consciously said it was too early to say whether photovoltaic solar would be better than thermal so, solar. Yeah. And even when it looked like it was going to be better, there was still some advantage of solar thermal because of heat storage. And so you try very hard not to. But, um, but fundamentally, yes, you, you do want to fund the best ideas and yeah. admit the best students. <laughs> That's true. Uh, the only thing that I'd add to that is that we are trying to be <laughs> conscious of the fact that there will be technology advances as we move forward over the next few years. So for a lot of the programs that we have, we're not going to put out all of the funding at once. So for instance, on the direct air capture hubs, we have $3.5 billion for these direct air capture hubs, which are still you know, in technology development. So we're going to go forward with enough funding for two hubs hold back some of that funding, encourage some pre-feasibility companies, encourage companies that are ready for feasibility studies, and then go out again because we know that the technology is going to get better over the years. And so we're not going to go out and pick four winners right away. We'll pick two winners, and then hopefully there'll be more winners to choose from in a couple of years. I think there was a question. There two. Oh, I want to there one down here. Yeah. You first. Oh, you first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi, my name's Darcy. I'm a second year master's student in energy science engineering with a focus on energy storage. Um, I had a question about uh, thermal energy storage, especially given the last question, um, talking about how uh, there are some winners and there are some losers. Right now, hydrogen has received a lot of funding from the IRA and uh, thermal energy storage really didn't seem to, to receive that much funding, if any funding, 
especially in an industrial context in comparison. And I was wondering um, if you had any ideas why that was or any ideas about the benefits uh, or, yeah, the, the benefits of thermal energy storage or lack thereof. Well, I, I think, I think the uh, thermal energy qualifies under the long duration energy storage, which is, I think, defined as at least 10 hours and up to, what, 120 hours? Uh, and that's right, Kelly, right? That thermal, yeah, so, and, you know, it, it, why is it 500 million uh, for long duration energy storage and some of the others got several billion? Um, you know, I wasn't there when, I mean, uh, Congress decided what the numbers are. But, I mean, I do think thermal storage, you know, has a shot with what we do. I mean, you know, if you ask me what did they miss, I would say they missed geothermal. Now, there, there is money in the DOE for geothermal, but we don't have a program for geothermal, which is somewhat disappointing. But, you know, we could focus on what we don't have or we could focus on all the things that we can do to make a difference. And, we choose to do the latter. So, do you? Hi, uh, I'm Charlie. I'm a sophomore undergrad studying international relations with uh, concentration in energy, environment, and uh, natural resources. Some of the conversation around um, the hydrogen hubs and some of the other hubs, specifically in um, emerging emerging industries with technology that's developing, made me think about how you. Um, sort of are approaching the hydrogen hubs specifically, um, thinking about sort of, sort of the optimal would be green hydrogen, but we're not there yet. And um, some of that infrastructure involved could be sort of entrenched over time. So, so how do you think about um, that decision-making process with the hydrogen hubs and, and I guess, um, phasing from blue to green over time? You know, it's it's a very it's a very good question, and and again, mo the competitive process that they usually use at the DOE, you know, tries to create to the fullest extent possible, you know, uh, apples to apples comparison. But we have gone. One of our frequently asked questions is, what does the perfect hydrogen hub look like to the Department of Energy? And we have to say. There is no perfect prototype of a, of a hydrogen hub, number one. And number two, we've been specifically told by Congress to, to look at it on a portfolio theory basis. And so, so um, you know, we don't know yet what formal proposals come in, but one of the things we're debating internally, what if someone comes in and they don't, pro they don't propose hydrogen production at all? They just propose hydrogen storage and six pipelines. One of the questions we're asking is, you know, natural gas uh, is traded off the Henry Hub in the United States. The Henry Hub is a place. The Henry Hub is, you know, near Abbeville, Louisiana. It's a place where they have storage in seven different pipelines. So, so they create a market. Should we be intentionally creating a hydrogen hub, which again may have no hydrogen production but be near a lot of pipelines? So. You know, we don't have any uh, firm answer to that. Uh, and if we did, I probably wouldn't tell, it, tell you to it. That's, uh, but, but, you know, the combination that we have to think about how all the pieces fit together. And we actually apologize to the bidders. We're like, look, you know, you know you, one uh, uncertainty in your bidding is that we have to look at this on a portfolio <coughs> basis, not, not just you against the next person. And so... But we are going to try and create a system that has all the necessary elements, you know, to create a national hydrogen economy. Hi, um, I'm Gulati. I'm a first year student in the Atmosphere and Energy Program in the Civil Engineering uh, Department. Um, as a student who's developing a startup in uh, hydrogen um, and, and is also an international student, I wonder when I see such programs, how can international clean energy founders developing in America benefit from such amazing programs? Well, I mean, I think one of the things that, uh, um, that makes America great is that we'll accept ingenuity and intelligence and hard work from wherever it comes. But uh, so I would say bring your talents to the United States and, and, and work here. Uh, you know, I think, um, you know, as was reported in the press a week or two ago, there is some griping from America's European allies that the, the legislation that allows us to do what we do is, has, a, has a sort of a you know, very American orientation and the, and the sponsors have to be American entities. But, but you know, you know, 
you know, talented international uh, persons like yourself, I think, you know, it's not that hard to work within that context. You know, my response to our European allies in particular, if anyone asked me, would be like, yeah, you know, you know, to get this through the United, to get all this funding through the United States contra uh, Congress, there had to be a certain amount of American, you know, uh, clear American benefit. You know, we would love to see our allies all, you know, put their own money against the same sort of programs. And then, you know, we'd be again where, you know, the success story we had with solar, where it was multiple countries that were incenting solar, you know, to get down the cost. Uh, let me make a quick comment with respect to that. In Davos, there was Europeans that were <clears throat> complaining about how U.S. centric. If you want this money, you know, move your you move it move it to the United States and everything. And they, if I think Birol was asked about that, he said, "No, no, America is spending investing huge amounts of money. If the Europeans are complaining about, it, maybe their countries should also invest that kind of money <laughs> uh, because uh, you know." Uh, Germany started the solar by really heavily subsidizing solar in Germany, and it, and it stimulated China to invest in manufacturing. Yeah. And, and so the Germans were actually, because they were so heavily uh, subsidizing solar, it got industry going. This I see as a very large subsidy. Mm -hmm. uh, what I forget what you call non-equity uh, whatever's uh, we call them grants mm -hmm. <laughs> free equity <laughs> free equity it's called a grant here's some money <laughs> do it uh, there's uh, in the R plan there's also huge uh, tax incentives which are really motivating entry but here's the problem they will do this when there are these tax incentives the hope is to drive down the cost in getting deployment significantly so that it's not it's not going to be a hundred dollars or 150 dollars mm. to capture carbon out of the atmosphere well I'd, i'll take a hundred any day of the week it's about 300 <laughs> but if you can get that then it's a it's a really different sort of space so the hope is can you get the first the second with the subsidies drive down the costs so it becomes within earshot of then saying okay you can have permanent subsidies Sadly, I think we're going to have to end it uh, for the big program and move on to the next phase of your session here right now. So thank you, David and Steve, for such a spellbinding and inspirational session. I think we would, many of us, I think, would probably stay here all night in this format if we could. So thanks, thanks very much for coming. Thank you.